Okay. Now, welcome. Welcome to Purchasing for a Better World, how to buy your buy for your business, our community, and the planet. I'm Jackie Donaldson, the New Hub Coordinator of Green Economy Peterborough, and I'm replacing Natalie Stevenson, who launched this initiative um, and has guided it for almost three years. Natalie will still be connected to Green Economy Peterborough, for those who know her, through her new role as Director of Programs at Green Up, and will be supporting our webinar today. So I'm wondering, there she is. Hi, Natalie. Um, we, uh, I will just, here we go, <laughs> here's our speakers. So for our agenda today, um, I can hear you giggling, Natalie. <laughs> um, uh, so as you know, we have three great speakers today and all will be slightly different, have a slightly different experience of sustainable procurement. We have Raisa Faruqi from Bisocial Canada, who's joining us from Calgary. Bill Lett from Lett Architects and Scott Morrison from Wild Rock Outfitters. Both Bill and Scott are both innovative business leaders in our own community. Um, and as we move forward, um, I would just wanted to uh, let you know that uh, we need to tell you a little bit about Green Economy Peterborough for, before we start. So um, for those, uh, Green Economy Peterborough may be familiar for, for many of you, as we do have many members here um, joining us today, which is terrific. Um, we are a local program and network of uh, businesses, business leaders seeking to reduce their environmental impact. Um, Natalie will share our, um, web, our, our link for you. Um, we, I'm just scrolling down here. Um, we, uh, Green Economy Peterborough's work, members work through a series of milestones to identify and set and achieve sustainability goals that both reduce their environmental footprint and improve their efficiency and resiliency. Uh, we provide them with coaching and tools and learning opportunities, funding opportunities uh, to measure and reduce their impact, to network with others and to celebrate successes. So while Green Economy Peterborough is a local uh, project of Green Up. We are also one of 10 hubs in the Green Economy Canada Network, a collective of businesses, business and organizational leaders that recognize the benefits and opportunities and significance, importantly, of making this transition to a vibrant and inclusive low carbon future. Um, there we are. I'm, my screen is to the side if you see me looking over there every once in a while. Um, it's a wonderful bunch. Uh, we, one of the most important features of Green Economy in Peterborough is that we're local. We buy each other's products and services. We are business peers, we're neighbors, we're friends. We see each other around town at events, in parks and on our bikes. <laughs> and we sometimes work together on projects. Um, it's a great group. And in fact, we have quite a few members in attendance today. Uh, including, and I might, I'm just looking, scrolling through my screen here. I know that there are uh, members from uh, Trent Health in Motion, uh, Charlotte Products, Engage Engineering, Lake Edge, uh, Wild Rock and Let, obviously, and Green Up. Um, and I might, if I'm missing any of you, you're welcome to introduce yourselves. It would be wonderful to hear from you. Um, I got everybody. County of Peterborough. And County of Peterborough. Peterborough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Absolutely. The County of Peterborough. Hi, Jackie. It's Eleni Gagovsky. I'm here from Peterborough and Kawartha's Economic Development as well. Great. Thank you, Eleni. Does anybody else want to introduce themselves? Um, hi, hi, hi um, Eleni. Um, Hi, everybody, actually. Uh, Joy Lachika here uh, from Town Ward City Councilor, and uh, just so eager to hear um, everything today related to our downtown, vibrant downtown businesses. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, so we also have a new member to add to this cloud, um, and that is Charlotte Products who like all these other organizations are very committed to their community and sustainability. So they're all leaders in their own way and we call them green economy leaders and they all have very interesting stories to tell. And so we'll be hearing from two of them today. 
Um, of note, uh, just to keep this in mind, uh, we'll be sharing some of these stories at our upcoming Leadership and Sustainability Awards on Thursday, April 20th. And you'll want to come out for that. It will be the second year of the awards and our first in person. <laughs> um, so make sure you're signed up for our newsletter. Um, Natalie will be posting a link on that so that you find out more details when that event comes up and others like this one. So um, important to note, and we did have two people uh, identify themselves. Uh, actually, well, we, we, it's important for you to know that um, we uh, have an advisory committee right, and it's made, made up. Oh, somebody's got their speaker on. Uh, and but we have an advisory committee that is very important to us and, and they do share their experience and their expertise and they support us in, in numerous ways. And we are very appreciative of them and uh you know and and together with the members and 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 other interested people and businesses in the community uh we are all headed hopefully for this wonderful vision that uh, uh peterborough uh Gortha's economic development has and that is to be the most sustainable and innovative community and economy in ontario which i love that sounds great to me um so uh whoops i'm gonna go back to our agenda slide um, and uh, we are going to get this party started. So there we go. So our um, first our first speaker, uh, I want you to give a, a, a warm welcome to Areza Faruqi. Um, as I indicated uh, earlier, Reza is joining us today from Calgary and has generously offered her time to provide you with an overview of such a procurement and the incredible impact that it can have on communities. She'll also tell us about her organization and the work they're doing with the city of Peterborough to introduce this strategy locally. Uh, Reza is the manager of education and consulting at Biosocial Canada, a social enterprise that believes that procurement is more than an economic transaction. It contributes to community, social, and economic goals. In her role, Reza works with governments and businesses as they leverage their purchasing to create positive economic, social, cultural, and environmental impacts in their communities, including the city of Peterborough. So, I am going to pass this over to Raisa, and I will I will do your slides for you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank, Thank you, Jackie. You. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, like Jackie said, my name is Raisa Fruki, um, and I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika Kainai Pikani, uh, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, as well as the Métis Nation, um, Region 3. And uh, yeah, I've called this land my home since I moved here many years ago as a newcomer, um, and I'm very blessed to. Uh, so yeah, very excited to be coming here today to talk about um, social and sustainable procurement. Um, and maybe let's just start with the word procurement. Um, essentially, that is just a fancy word for purchasing. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about. So purchasing or procurement, um, I think in North America, uh, as we all know, um, has uh, sort of the end goal historically has been to derive economic value. So a purchaser has historically been looking for the lowest possible cost for their good or service, and the supplier um, is trying to make money from that transaction. Now, if we look at that equation, and if we add social value to our existing purchasing, that's what social procurement is. So as you can see in the equation, we still have that purchaser value and supplier value, but that same equation takes into account the value, the social value you can create in the purchasing. Therefore, the end goal is no longer creating economic value alone, but also creating value for the community. And so why is that important? So I'll ask Jackie to go to the next slide. Because we know that every purchase has an economic, environmental, cultural, and social impact, whether intended or not. And social procurement is essentially seeking the best possible value for your purchase. 
When we focus on best value for money, procurement or purchasing is much more than a financial transaction. It becomes a tool for building healthy communities. And so what makes up a healthy community? We use this framework called community capital as a way to uh, identify what makes up a healthy community. So of course we need things like income and finances and actual capital to flow in our communities. We need that economic capital. But we also need things like the need for culture and diversity and respect, cultural capital. We also need human capital. We need um, the opportunities for our members of our community to gain skills, to learn, to train, and to grow as individuals. And also the physical capital what is the natural environment, the manufactured environment um, of our community? How healthy is it? As well as the social capital, the actual glue that holds our communities together, families, institutions, and networks. So all these different capitals end up creating a healthy community. And best value for money, which is what social procurement is seeking for, is essentially helping to create community capital. So social procurement and sustainable procurement is uh, trying to um, increase community capital. That is the end goal. And so that's a very theoretical kind of big picture look at what that is. But what are those actual goals? So that could be things like increasing economic opportunity for underrepresented groups or more visible uh, visibility of diverse suppliers, social enterprises, and small businesses in our supply chain, as well as sustainable businesses like uh, many on this call. Uh, maybe it could be increasing uh, opportunities for apprenticeship and training for members of our community, and just community development benefits um, overall. So why is social procurement important? What is the point of it? Well, if you're a purchaser, and especially maybe government, you're achieving best value while purchasing. You're levering, leveraging your per purchasing to create positive impacts in your community. So social procurement and sustainable procurement can help address some social sustainable outcomes that you want in your community. If you're a private sector, a business, um, it can help increase your reputation to external stakeholders because they can directly see the positive impacts you're having in the community. Your employees can be more satisfied because they see the direct impact their work has in the communities that they live and work in. And it can also help meet your mission, vision, purpose objectives. For suppliers who supply to these purchasers, um, many purchasers now are asking for what social value, what sustainable value can you create? So to be competitive, you must be able to respond to social value demand in things like competitive bids. So it can be really good for you yourself to um, implement social procurement in your business. It can help you increase your reputation to stakeholders, investors, as well as employee satisfaction. And the data backs us up too. So if we flip to the next slide, um, a study was done um, around the economic multiplier effect. And there's a few studies like this, but I think this is one um, really good uh, example from British Columbia, um, where they did a study and it showed that for every $100 spent with a local office supply business, $63 was reinvested locally versus if that $100 had been spent with a big box multinational corporation, only $14 was reinvested locally. So just think that $63, it's recirculating, it's staying in that community and um, the amount of positive impact that can actually have. So, um, oh, maybe just, uh, oh, is this Oh, so there was uh, one uh, one story I think I added in uh, in a different presentation, but um, just a simple story I'll share from Peterborough. Um, so some of you might be familiar in downtown. There's uh, these really cool bike racks um, that you have um, with some cool uh, edging. Um, on, and it shows different uh, scenes of Peterborough. Um, so before that, I think the city had some kind of typical bike racks, um, and those were being supplied from uh, Oregon, from the states. 
the city was interested in upgrading those and they said, okay, we could either go with the same US supplier, um, but maybe we should research if they're more local and sustainable alternatives to this manufacturer. So they did some research and they came across a local business called City Welding Works, um, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, so City Welding Works, they didn't make bike racks at the time, um, but uh, the city asked, hey, do you maybe want to try this? Can we pilot this? You you are welders. Um, and so this kickstarted a really great relationship. The city started purchasing from City Welding Works, which helped that business increase their capacity um, and ended up with them being able to purchase this very high tech um, piece of equipment that uh, was able to create those really great bike racks, which um, can you can now see in uh, downtown. Um, and so for the city, they were able to keep the purchase local. And uh, if we're thinking environmental cost, it really helped to reduce the shipping cost and all those other associated environmental costs, um, as well as installation charges, um, since this business was right in town, it was just down the street. Um, so it was both a very socially impactful and uh, environmentally impactful, as well as cost effective um, decision. So just a simple story to highlight how your purchasing decision can have so much impact. And it just takes um, kind of just a little thinking to consider maybe um, how can we shift this and what could be the impacts of that. So uh, if we flip to the next slide, a couple myths um, kind of to bring up and some facts uh, as we talk about social and sustainable procurement. So for public sector, um, they have these things called trade agreements, which kind of they're beholden to. And the myth is that trade agreements don't allow social procurement. The fact is that trade agreements have parameters to work within, but they still definitely allow social value outcomes. So the trade agreements say that you have to be open, fair and transparent to all um, bidders. Um, so procurement cannot limit who can bid but um, you can still seek social value outcomes from all bidders. All bidders can create employment opportunities and skills and training opportunities and ha have uh, supply chains that uh, create social value. So you can't restrict to things like local bidders, um, but you can seek social value outcomes. The trade agreements also have exceptions um, for direct purchasing from uh, prison labor, for instance, as well as nonprofits and indigenous set-asides. And they also have thresholds. So if you're below the trade agreement threshold, so think low value purchases, uh, low cost, um, then a purchaser, a public sector purchaser can direct that however they want, um, which I'll show you the city is uh, using um, to their advantage. The next myth is that social procurement means lower quality and higher costs. Um, and with a lot of purchasers now implementing social procurement and lots of case studies coming out, um, just not just in Canada, but also internationally, um, there is no evidence to support that claim. The reason being, again, is that social procurement is not solely about achieving social value or sustainable value outcomes alone, um, but it's taking into consideration along with the important factors of price and quality and such. So the weighting factors and percentages in uh, you know, a competitive bid or even just a simple um, purchase like catering, um, you're going to determine it based on multiple factors, not just the social outcome as well as price. Um, so it's right now not seen any evidence to support that claim because these are all important factors. So some examples of folks who are doing this already, the paradigm shift at the federal level, the Public Service and Procurement Canada has a social procurement policy and are piloting currently. Infrastructure Canada also has what's known as Community Employment Benefit um, Initiative, where uh, if you are funded um, in a certain funding stream from Infrastructure Canada um, for a major infrastructure project, then there are predetermined community employment benefit um, outcomes that are attached to that project and have to be delivered on. 
Municipally, uh, the city of Peterborough has implemented a social procurement policy, as well as many others like Calgary, Edmonton, um, and so on. I'm not going to read all of them, but uh, they're all on the slide there. Um, British Columbia Social Procurement Initiative as well. That is over 35 rural communities in British Columbia um, across Vancouver Island, the Sunshine Coast, um, as well as the Kootenays. Um, all uh, implementing social procurement, and they've actually, uh, due to the context being so similar for all of them, being rural communities, have started um, this group that shares best practices. Institutionally, we have uh, Anchor TO, which is 18 an anchor institutions, uh, things like hospitals and universities, who gather together to uh, also share best practices and learnings and tools around social procurement. Um, York University, University of Toronto, and BC Housing as well have uh, implemented social procurement policies or are um, piloting it. Um, and in the business world, uh, SAP, a very giant international uh, tech technology firm, is one of the leaders in social procurement on the private side, um, as well as Chandos Construction uh, here in Canada, um, really leading in the construction sector, um, social procurement. So if we look at the city of Peterborough, um, the city council voted uh, on September 26 to update the procurement bylaw to include social procurement. Um, and it has since been uh, adopted, came into effect in November. And the city has since initiated a three-year social procurement implementation strategy. So these include things like piloting projects um, to test the inclusion of social procurement, establishing a community multi-stakeholder working group, um, internal and external stakeholder training programs, and uh, of course, measurement and reporting processes. So if we look just at high level, what is the city doing? What does social procurement mean to them? What are they trying to achieve? Um, you can have a look at the bylaw. It's fairly long, but uh, it's, it's a good read for sure. Um, but here are the objectives that the city is seeking to leverage existing um, procurement activities to achieve positive social value objectives that align with city strategic goals and plans. These are local economic development and employment, supporting local businesses, prioritizing inclusion and diversity, social equity and sustainable community development, socioeconomic goals derived from environmental sustainability purchasing, and strengthening arts, heritage, and culture. So these goals have come from um, multiple strategic plans uh, that the city already has in place um, and are essentially the principles that will be driving the decision making, the purchasing decision making for the city. So many of you I know are um, suppliers or businesses um, and you can engage with the city of Peter Peterborough social procurement. The first is you can sign up on the vendor registry. So this uh, is a pilot um, It came out in December. So you may not have heard of it, but I'm going to let you know now. Um, so the vendor registry is for city staff to easily find suppliers that support the social value objectives, um, specifically for low value purchases. So again, the purchases under the trade ag agreement thresholds. Um, and since it's under the trade agreement, they can direct purchasing however they want. And so here, they're really focusing on supporting local businesses, social enterprises, diverse owned businesses, and suppliers in general who contribute to the social value objectives. Um, and so you can uh, go register. It's at the City of Peter Rose Bids and Tenders webpage. I can throw it in the chat as well later. Um, so I would highly encourage you to uh, register on there, um, especially being a sustainable business too is uh, one way um, in which you are contributing to the social value objectives. Um, so it'd be good uh, for you to register so city staff know um, you're out there and that they can purchase from you. Um, the second way is social value questions in competitive bids. So these are purchases above $10,000. So they're above the trade agreement threshold. Um, and so the city needs to put out a competitive bid. Um, and so here, a social value questionnaire will be included as part of the weighted and evaluated criteria, along with price quality and other required components. So the city will be putting this in their um, multiple, their, their com competitive bids um, as a way to assess for social value. So there are different pathways in which you yourself can implement social procurement. Um, that first one is social purchasing. So purchasing goods and services. 
Um, and the second is those community benefit agreements. So um, on big infrastructure and land development projects. So if we look just at social purchasing, how do you build in social procurement opportunities? It's really asking yourself, what are you going to buy and who would be your usual supplier? What would it, it cost and which social value supplier or local business can you work with to maximize the social impact of um, your existing spend, similar to what the city did with those bike racks? And so you might think, oh, there's not enough uh, you know, social value suppliers for what I need to purchase. Um, and I'd really encourage you to use something like this concentric circle in your decision making. So think of it like a target. Um, in the middle, this is just an example, we have a social enterprise. Um, and so for me, I would say, okay, my ideal is I have a social enterprise um, that I can purchase from, but maybe the price doesn't work for me or maybe a social prize doesn't uh, exist. So I would go out to the outer ring and say, okay, a local business with a social value. Is there a local business out there that uh, creates some social value? If not, okay, I'll go see if there's a regional business with a social value. So you're basically saying what is the best possible value I can create um, that makes sense for me based on price quality and if that supplier exists. So if you yourself want to um, implement social procurement, um, this is the strategy process we use. You first want to look at what is your overall strategic goals as an organization. Um, and then looking at the four key social procurement opportunity areas of employment, skills and training, your actual supply chain, and community development. And from there, figuring out what objectives um, can help create uh, those outcomes for those strategic goals you've already identified. Then you want to think of how you can actually implement this. What are your tactics? So for the city, for example, they're uh, looking at their low value purchases. They're looking at their competitive bids. And then you want to come up with some metrics um, to be able to see, you know, what it, does success mean for you? And um, are you actually accomplishing it? So we have uh, at buysocialcanada.com tons of resources for free. If you are interested in learning more, we've got a guide to social procurement, a supplier guide to social procurement, um, as well as uh, for construction and infrastructure and such. Um, we also have um, a professional um, development program, the Social Procurement um, Professional Certificate, uh, just on the next slide, um, which is uh, a four-part um, course um, around uh, very much the demand side um, of uh, procurement, um, so the purchaser, and the next cohort is April 2023, um, but we really just go through uh, the first understanding social procurement, the history, all the way to actually operationalizing it in your organization, so um, if you're interested, just check out our website. And so the next slide and uh, what I want to leave you with is that this is a very nonlinear journey to implement social procurement. Um, but there's key components like learning about it, drafting a strategy or a policy, testing it, measuring it and leading on it. Um, and so these are just some areas in which um, could be your next steps on your own journey as you look at social and sustainable procurement. Um, and by Social Canada, this is all we do is social procurement, and we have tons of supports and services um, available if you are interested. Um, but with that, thank you very much, and I'll pass it back to Jackie. Thank you so much, Reza. I always uh, enjoy, uh, it's a very creative way of approaching challenges and, and problems in our communities. And uh, so I really appreciate hearing from Bi Social Canada and, and the work that you're doing with our community. Um, so next up, we have Bill Lett. And uh, most of you know the work of Lett Architects. Over the years, they have beautifully and profoundly added to the visual impact of Peterborough's built environment, Hospice Peterborough, uh, the new Peterborough Animal uh, Care Centre, Brock Mission, the Medical Arts Building on Charlotte, Crescent Street Townhomes, and uh, many others, and of course the new Canoe Museum on Ashburnham and the Fire Hall, the Net Zero Fire Hall, which will open, both of which will open in the next short 
couple of, like a year, maybe. <laughs> um, you'll Let's be able to speak that. to that way better than I do. <laughs> Um, but it's not about looks, right? Let is also a well-known business leader and they're implementing practices that support work-life balance and workplace culture. They're involved in many philanthropic activities among other things. And um, as you'll see, they're deeply involved in influencing the procurement practices of the construction industry. So Bill has extensive hands-on experience dealing with diverse stakeholders, administrators, planning processes, municipal and regional councils, and government agencies. He has led the design of major municipal, cultural, healthcare, and institutional pro projects across the province. And he's a registered architect in the province of Ontario and in 2008 was convocated into the College of Fellows of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. So I am going to introduce Bill and uh, thank you for joining us, Bill. And you just nod or, <laughs> or, or pause when you would like me to. <laughs> sure. Well, Thanks for that great introduction. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Thank okay. Go, go. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, really appreciate it. Um, you know, a little bit about us. I'm, I'm not sure everybody knows the things that we're doing, but um, we are a Peterborough practice, but I'm happy to say that um, we are now also a Collingwood practice. Uh, this year we're opening uh, a Collingwood studio and uh, we're happy to be able to service the Georgian Triangle um, geographic area through that uh, through that studio. Um, we, uh, I can say that our Peterborough practice is a net zero practice um, and uh, we take that very seriously. Um, the majority of our work is with municipalities and not-for-profit organizations and um, currently we have a staff complement broken down as you see um, here. Uh, one of the things we do take seriously and I will point out is that uh, we always do have co-op students in the studio. Um, we are teaching practice and we take that very seriously so not only are we working with the universities um, but we are also working with um, community colleges as well to make sure that we've got students um, in our practice and learning um, what it is the real world world looks like um, as far as working in an architectural practice is concerned. I'm very pleased um, when we talk about um, uh, social commitment to be able to say that we were one of the first architectural practices in um, Canada to be B Corp certified and currently we're the highest certified practice in Canada and the third highest in the world. And really, you know, what that means is that um, we want to redefine what uh, the success of for profit business looks like and um, start to rethink what uh, what for profit business can do for the communities that it's working. Next slide. Um, we are also members of uh, um, the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Um, we're trying to work really closely with, um, with the Aboriginal communities to understand really what duty to consult means on our project and, and how to, to, to be more inclusive when it comes to infrastructure projects um, within our communities. And, uh, and so um, as part of that as well, next slide, um, we're also looking at different ways to, um, to do construction. Uh, we're members of the Integrated Project Delivery Alliance, which is basically a set of like-minded companies that wants to look at better outcomes in, uh, in construction in Canada. Um, IPDA has, uh, is in its seventh year now. Um, I have sat on the board for, uh, this is my sixth uh, year. Um, and my last, um, but uh, it's been really great to be involved with a group of people who want to look at different ways of delivering construction. Um, uh, because, you know, when you look at other industries and you look at what we're doing in our industry, um, our productivity is going down, um, our success rates are going down, and uh, there's got to be a better way of doing that. And part of that really is about, uh, about how we do things around the procurement models. Next. Obviously happy to be a, a founding member of Green Economy Peterborough. This is something that we take very seriously. We've really enjoyed working with them to, uh, to help get us to our, our um, uh, net zero goals uh, with, within our studio. And, uh, and it's something that, uh, that we can bring to our projects too. So here we go, next slide. Let's talk about um, social procurement and construction. And I think it really comes down to what uh, Raisa was saying around um, community capital. And that's where I'd like to focus today in, in the work that we're doing. So um, what facilitates it when you're looking at a construction project? Obviously it's the willingness of a team. We have to have the owner on board, um, the designers on board, the constructors on board to embrace something new. Um, 
there are various contract models and the IPDA is looking at um, more collaborative contract models. Um, obviously a more collaborative contract model would help facilitate that. And um, then there's also the groups or organizations with the ability to provide certain goods and services. So if we dive in a little deeper, the willingness of a team. Um, so the owner has to have some type of value proposition. Um, if we're um, looking at sustainability, that's one aspect of it. If, uh, if, if we're looking at how to engage with the community, that's another aspect. And I'll speak to some certain examples. Um, when it comes to the designers, um, there's um, a lot of value and experience that they can bring to the table, but it's how to leverage that with the owner and then ultimately the builder, because I think the, the builder is one of the most important um, parts of this equation, as long as the, the foundations are there with, with regard to the contractual model, then um, we have uh, the ability to do great things within communities. So let's talk about that contract model. Um, it is harder um, to procure and engage um, locally in a traditional design bid build model. Um, so we like contracts that can promote collaboration and are better suited to social procurement. As an example, if we go to the next slide, Oh, no, sorry, different slide. So yeah, this is, let's, before we um, go to the examples, let's look at the traditional models. So traditionally what ends up happening is we have an owner that contracts with an architect and consultants, and then the owner contracts with a, a contractor and their sub trades. And then how it ends up fold, unfolding is usually like this, where we can get into a combative um, model and the contracts don't really um, allow us to do things that are outside of the box, if you will. Whereas there are examples, here we go. Um, uh, construction management is really um, a model that uh, we have in our industry that's available to us and has been for a long time um, that provides more flexibility to include local involvement and uh, also the integrated project delivery contract, which was new in 2018, which, uh, which gives us a lot more flexibility to do some really interesting things. Um, Raisa's organization, um, she showed this as well, um, published the guide to social procurement and construction and infrastructure projects. Um, we were very honored at Lead Architects to be one of 26 organizations that signed on to this document and um, recently have been involved in uh, um, some discussions around uh, the release of the second document. And this is, if you are in the construction industry, a great tool to understand how each, construction, uh, each contractual model um, can facilitate um, that kind of community capital piece, cultural capital piece and social capital piece um, within the construction industry. Okay. So as far as experience is concerned, um, if we go to the next slide, um, when uh, when we started, um, when I started my career, one of the first projects I, I worked on was uh, the Shaw Festival Theatre Production Centre in Niagara-on-the-Lake. And uh, the Shaw, although it is the second largest repertory theatre company in the world, um, they had a lot of local support. And so when we were talking about contractual models, we said that we really felt construction management was the way to go because there were a lot of local trades um, that could, uh, that were were really devoted to the project. They, they, the Shaw to them was an organization that they wanted to work towards. And so through the model, we were able to find a builder who was really keen on bringing a lot of those trades on board. Um, all that beautiful oak that you can see in the background was by a local, um, a local woodworker um, who was able to produce some of the, the, the walls and millwork in the building. And so it was, it was kind of a, a dipping the toe in the water to look at what kind of community capital could, uh, could be had in projects. Next slide. Um, we then had a really interesting project where we were hired to do the Morton Community Health Center in Lakefield. Um, when we were hired, we were told that there was, um, uh, the community was so engaged in this that there were contractors and subtrades that were willing to donate about $2 million towards a $4 million building back in 2008. Um, and, and we had to find a mechanism in order to 
um, to have donations of material and labor brought into the project, as well as using this um, project as a training tool um, for some of the students at Sir Sandford Funding College. So this was this became a more interesting prospect for us and um, was a really successful outcome. Again, this project was construction management. Uh, next. I see Craig Mortlock is uh, on this uh, on this uh, call, and there he is wearing a tie, which is highly unusual. Um, but uh, um, when uh, when the county of Peterborough came to us and said, "Can you uh, can you help us out with um, the agricultural heritage building at Lang?" It was it was Craig who came to the table and said, "We've got this relationship with Fleming College. Um, could we use this as a as a training tool?" and uh, we had to do some redesign on the building to make it modular. The building was actually, um, the majority of the building was, uh, the envelope of the building was constructed in the Fleming College um, building on the Fleming campus and then brought to site and erected uh, on site. And, and Craig was instrumental in making that uh, that happen. So it, it involved, in this case, an owner who was willing to, to use the students um, as part of the project, it was a contractor who was promoting this and then the designers, um, you know, structurally and architecturally, there were a lot of significant changes that had to be made to, to make this happen, but we were all on board and, and it was a, a great experience for the community um, and, uh, and is a great story for the County of Peterborough and for Lang and Fleming. Um, another project completed with Mortlock Construction, in this case it was Design Build. Um, there, the community rallied, much like the Lakefield Project, the Morton Community Health Center Project for hospice. Um, a lot of the community wanted to come together. As an example, Havelock Metal was prepared to donate all the material supplies for the roof. And um, we needed a mechanism again where this could work. And although this was a design build um, contract model, that still allowed for some flexibility within it and understanding of how we could utilize localized trades um, within this project. So, so not only is this project inherently bringing, you know, that kind of that that social capital, obviously, um, given its use, but uh, um, we were able to bring together the local community, and it was mostly um, uh, the majority of the trades on this project were were all local, which was great for us and and a real local success story. And then lastly, we have uh, the Canadian Canoe Museum. So here, this project obviously speaks the cultural capital. Um, it has, uh, you know, <laughs> an enormous importance when in telling the story of the history of Canada um, through the canoe. Uh, but also this project is integrated project delivery. It's an IPD model project. And as integrated project delivery is new, uh, fairly new um, uh, to Canada and Ontario um, and becoming more popular. It was really important for the owner, the museum, um, and for the team, including the builder, who is Shandos, who uh, Ray mentioned um, in her presentation, uh, and for us that um, we also use this project as a way to um, uh, train others who had not done IPD. So um, as an example, um, although it is a sophisticated building, um, we knew that there were team members locally that um, could be involved in this project to create a successful project. Um, a perfect example of this is Lancer Electric. We did a series of interviews for electrical subtrades and uh, and um, although we were interviewing some of the largest electrical subtrades in Canada, ultimately landed on on Lancer. They had no IPD experience and it was great and has been great to have a local subtrade working on an international project like this. So this was this was there were certain decisions made in this project um, that were really important decisions early on. Unfortunately, we were also looking at how we could bring a lot of labor to this project. Um, and uh, and that didn't um, work out the way we wanted it to. Um, we also reached out again to Fleming College to see if uh, they could get um, their students involved with one particular aspect of the project, but it didn't align with their term. But we did try. We certainly tried to do that. And um, and then ultimately we also um, changed our, our uh, heavy timber wood manufacturer uh, to a company that isn't too far away in Cremor, Ontario, who we worked through the design of the mass timber components with, and they're doing the erection of on this particular project. 
So with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm uh, just watching the time and I, I don't want us to miss this next speaker. Um, so we're going to move on and uh, check in with uh, Scott Mearson from Wild Rock Outfitters. Um, uh, this, I, I experienced something very unique um, with uh, contacting uh, Scott. And, and I, so I want you to listen to this bio really carefully. Um, Scott Murison is an outdoor enthusiast and one of the owners of Wild Rock Outfitters, a popular outdoor gear and apparel store located in Peterborough, Ontario. He moved to the area, area in 1992 and has a passion for the outdoors, spending much of his free time exploring the natural beauty of the region. Scott has extensive experience in the outdoor industry and has been with Wild Rock Outfitters since always since 1992 they said that again at wild rock he is the there's a reason why i say that at wild rock he is the cfo and director of making things happen under his guidance wild rock outfitters has become a leading destination for outdoor enthusiasts enthusiasts looking for quality gear expert advice and exceptional customer service um there's a little bit more there i'm gonna stop because i want to introduce scott a little bit myself but that a uh, little uh, bio really speaks to something really special about Wild Rock, and that is that they're very innovative because that intro was actually written by artificial intelligence through chat GPT, which I find incredible. Um, so innovative as always, um, always taking risks, always trying new things. So Wild Rock has been long involved in our community and deeply committed to the natural world. And Scott has worked hard to infuse these values into Wild Rock's purchasing practices. And I look very forward to his presentation. And I will get your slides here ready for you. There you go, oh, other way, there we go. Scott, take it away. All right, well, thank you. Yes, I, I, I made it a bit of a groan when I was supposed to. And uh, send in a bio because I really don't like writing about myself. So I, I threw in, write a bio about Scott Murison space Wild Rock Outfitters. And that's what it spat out uh, in about 30 seconds. It's um, quite incredible. It, yeah. Carrying on, it, great listening to those other two speakers, uh, such big picture items and such things. But I'm going to talk about small boxes and small items. So uh, if you want to go to the next slide there, Jackie, that'd be great. So Wild Rock, um, we make our living one way or another through the outdoors. Uh, it's uh, it, uh, The outdoors is where our customers drive their, their passion. It's where our staff de develop their passion, and it's where we spend our time. And honestly, when you get down to it, without a healthy outdoor environment, uh, our business model just doesn't work. If we don't have lakes that you can go on, if we don't have forests that you can walk in, if we don't have fields that you can ride across, our business model doesn't work, end of story. And really, when you look at most of our business models, none of them really work without a healthy environment. So we take it reasonably seriously here. So if we can go to the next slide, Jackie. So we're a store and what's our problem with a store? Well, a store is just a box filled with items that we hope people come and buy. Uh, so in the procurement world or sourcing, we can look at what items do we put in this store? Um, but we make our living off of consumption, which is inherently bad. Less is more here. Um, so if our the easy way to get to it, if our carbon goal was zero, it's very easy. We fold the corporation, we shut it down, Wild Rock's uh, emissions become zero almost immediately. Unfortunately, that doesn't affect our community. Our community's carbon footprint will still be the same. Uh, because people will quickly find other places to get the items that we sell. They'll find quickly that uh, they can get it shipped in or another store will open or what have you. So that's clearly not the solution to making the items in our store cause less damage. So we hope to displace bad consumption with better consumption or with less consumption. So what does that mean? That means we hope to sell and provide items that are better quality, last longer, will get reused, and will go on for generations as opposed to more disposable type options. But 
as a store, it's not just the products that are in our store. We have lots of other inputs, right? We have staff, we have HVAC systems, we have cleaners, we have lights, we have all sorts of things that go in to make a store and a store operate. And staff is a is a huge one. That's a giant input. Um, the next slide, Jackie. Oh, we got it there. Perfect. Um, so the solution. So it's buying more intelligently and deliberately. So we are in a great spot in the outdoor world. We have, and in Peterborough, we have hundreds of vendors we can choose from. So we go about curating a collection of, of people that we buy products from. I'm just going to make sure you, yeah, um, and have done so for, for 30 years. Uh, an easy one to pick is someone like Patagonia, which to the core of their being, I don't think there's many people who lead by example better than they do in this world. And they've been an example that's been set for us and that we've followed and that we've worked with for 30 years. Uh, so one is buying products that perhaps are organic that we can resell. So obviously, uh, I mean, 10% of all agriculture, all herbicides and pesticides go into the production of cotton, uh, even though it's only 1% of the, uh, the agricultural land. So we started with this years ago, and we have many vendors that are either going to use organic cotton or bamboo or tensile or many different fabrics. So what the products are made out of, um, if they're natural and how they're manufactured, we take a, a close look at. The next one is, can we buy things that are made of recycled materials? And because one of the things that uh, goes into our clothing industry is polyesters and nylons, and they are very good at what they do, but have a massive cost to our environment. Um, and one of the unknown things we always talk about these, you know, pet bottles or what have you using uh, these chemicals, well, 60% of that stuff actually goes into clothing, into fabrics, into our, our couches, into all the different fabrics, and only 30% is used in bottles. So really looking at that. And when you look at a company like ours, 20 years ago, Patagonia was the the first people to ever have a recycled polyester like that. Now many do. Patagonia still does an amazing job and they've spread that into other areas, um, not just in the fleeces. But when you come into our store, the brands, each one will have a story about what is recycled. Each one will have what they're doing for organics in, um, in this. And, and, uh, and then there's the repurposing of things. Uh, a brand that comes to mind that we carry here is Cotopaxi, where they buy the offcuts from factories and then make things with those. So their colorful little packs or their fanny packs are made with offcuts from other manufacturers that would have gone into the landfill. So repurposing, repairing um, items as opposed to recycling and making sure that warranted items don't end up in the landfill. These are... Um, areas that we put under the microscope and we do our best to uh, examine. The next one is, uh, if you don't mind changing the slide, uh, is reducing the forever chemicals. So, so many things that go into building, whether it's a, a house or whether it's a, a, a jacket or a backpack or a pair of shoes have forever chemicals in them and trying to choose manufacturers who are tuned into this. Um, we don't want these forever chemicals ending up in our footwear because they, the uh, gases that were made to use them are gonna end up in the plant in Taiwan. And then the product is gonna be here in Peterborough and it's eventually gonna get into the landfill and it's eventually gonna get into our environment one way or the other. So many of our vendors are looking at adhesives. They're looking at durable water repellents and how to make these chemicals that in the past have been these forever products that will not break down in any time soon and end up in our environment with other, with other items. Um, so going to the next uh, slide, if you don't mind. Uh, there we go, great, thank you. So running the store, that's one of the other inputs. And running the store is more than just, you know, the hydro coming in where we use, we use a, a program through Bullfrog where we buy recs for all of our, um, electricity, all of our natural gas, and all of the fuel that goes in. And it's a very easy way to make yourself, I would never tout ourselves as carbon neutral, but we overbought our recs two years ago. And we're actually, what, it would, what I don't know what you call it when you're, when you've bought more than you actually, recs than you actually uh, consumed. Um, 
but we don't go around because we're not pretending that we're carbon neutral. We're producing carbon left, right, and center here. Um, but we're doing what we can to reduce it through bullfrog, which is forcing in more renewable resources into the grid. And then, um, oh, you know, stick with this one for a second. But the other things that go into running a store, when we look at inputs, um, yes, we have electricity. Yes, we have gas. Uh, then we're going to get into transportation. But remember, our the most valuable thing in our store are our people. And we know density is important and we know commuting costs are important. So it'll be interesting when this becomes a conversation, when we ask people who, if you have to be an in-store person or an in, um, you're not working remotely, where do you live? Does it make sense for you to work here? Uh, and those are gonna be some tough questions. If you have a, a employee who lives 50 kilometers away and one who works 10 kilometers away and they both have the same skills, should we be casting an eye on which one's gonna have the larger carbon footprint after a year? So just when we're thinking about inputs, we're thinking about everything. So coming into the density, I mean, there's a reason that, you know, Kieran and I have been walking and riding our bikes to work and we live in houses that would be smaller than the ones we could afford in the country and that would have less that have smaller yards than we could but it's all about density and uh, I extrapolate that into staff as well all right the next slide so we can have the greenest organic recycled product and we can put it on a jet plane and get it here and it has a horrible carbon footprint so looking at how we're having things shipped to our store is extremely important. Patagonia did an audit years ago. This is probably 15 years ago, and they thought they were going to get skewered with all of their polyester clothing and everything like that. And the two things that came up were cotton and transportation. Yeah. So never asking for rush delivery, making sure that you are not doing overnight shipments because of your poor planning or what have you. Bulk shipping by land is so much less costly to the environment. Same goes with our outbound, outbound goods. So if we're shipping, we have an online store, we're shipping, we're making sure we're using ground transportation. We don't even offer air freight. Um, yes, people may want it, but it's just not a path we're going to. Um, and then how our items get there, that last mile, same thing. If we're offering next day air, next day shipping and it's going to Victoria, it's gonna be put on an airplane at YYZ and it's gonna go over there. If we do it the slow, easy way, when we promise seven days or eight, 10 days, there's a chance that it's gonna get onto a truck and get there, which makes it much less costly. So no matter how organic the item is that we have in the store, we need to look after it as it comes in and goes out. Um, that's just a, a, a way of looking at our business in its, in its total effect. If we can go to the next slide, Jackie, is really when you look at your audits and you look at that air cargo versus, versus your HEVs, your, your big trucks, versus uh, that's inner waterways, which is more European. We're not shipping too many things up the Trent Severn Canal. It'd be pretty cool, but we're not. And then rail. Um, is is a, is a great way to go. So next time, you know, you you find the Amazon Prime next day delivery, choose the slower one, um, or buy it from a, a locally place where you can walk down and get it. Um, so it's just a yeah. There you go. Thank you. So the hard thing is with all of us at this sift to make the right choice. Uh, it's an easy choice as long as you've thought about it and realize it's gonna lower your standard of living and you're gonna have less money at the end of the day. And you've gotta be okay with that because um, that's doing the right thing, whether you're gonna make it organically or you're gonna make it out of recycled material or you're gonna ship it properly or you're gonna follow the social procurement process and, and the uh, environmental process, it will cost more in the way of time and effort and that's okay because we can all survive with less. All of us at this table that can for sure. So thank you for listening. But that's uh, social procurement from a, a Wild Rock perspective. Thank you so much, Scott. That was terrific.
Um, I, again, am, am noticing the time. Uh, I, I'm, I, our speakers indicated that they were okay to stay. Is that still good uh, for questions? Um, so I think we're just gonna move right on to questions and I'm wondering, uh, does anybody out there have any? Oh, they're such great speakers. Are you sure you want to have any? <laughs> Too good, maybe maybe a little too thorough. There's lots of people still here, so that does indicate that there was awesome. great, great interest. You can use the raise hand function or or throw up your uh, question in the chat. Dane is saying that they missed the bit of a procurement outside of local. Which presenter is that, Dane? Do you want to speak to that question? Hi, afternoon. Um, yeah, just with 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 procurement, um, much of much of the tenders that we that we put in as an organization, uh, like we we go, we cast our net pretty wide. Um, this is the I think it's Risa um, that that was yes, actually it was Risa that was speaking on it. Thank you. Um, and I I caught where where you're talking about um, some of the methods that that um, Peterborough is is using and and other areas but I think I stepped away um, when talking about um, like keeping keeping the net pretty small uh, sure yeah so um, so yeah we were saying for uh, local uh, procurement so um, in terms of public sectors, they have the trade agreements that they're beholden to. Um, so after uh, a certain threshold, so for the city of Peterborough, for instance, that's 10,000, um, they need to follow the trade agreements, which uh, the main tenant is that they have to be open, fair, and transparent to all bidders. Um, so in that situation, they cannot um, favor local bidders but they can still ask for social value outcomes uh, along things like employment, skills and training and such. Um, so that's what the city of Peterborough will be doing um, through a social value questionnaire that will be put on uh, competitive bids. So RFPs, um, things like that. Um, if the purchases are under $10,000, again, this is just for the city of Peterborough I'm speaking of, um, they have, uh, kind of and the option to do what they would like because it's under the trade agreements. And in that case, they are uh, favoring um, local businesses, uh, diverse businesses, um, social enterprises, as well as um, suppliers in general that support, uh, support the social value objectives. Uh, does that help? It does. Thank you very much. Okay, awesome. Craig, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Um, awesome presentation. Uh, very cool to see a couple projects that we uh, participated <laughs> on with Let. Uh, very, very cool to see that and um, speaks, I think, to uh, to local and what Bill was talking about with uh, incorporating local into your purchasing or your projects in any kind. Um, you start to align with like-minded people that care about local and that whole thing just gains momentum and as soon as you make that uh, a priority, uh, it's amazing to see what you can get invested out of it. However, I didn't come to pat my company on the back or anything like that or bills. Uh, but I, I did have a question. Um, one thing that we kind of see, we're seeing a lot of and we're hearing a lot about this, and I've attended numerous uh, with Raisa and, and many others at By Social Peterborough or By Social Canada and, and the city of Peterborough. But I think something that's daunting as a as a fairly small small SME in the area is all of the extra red tape that we are seeing. Um, like as a company, we believe wholeheartedly in everything that's on a checklist uh, that we've seen the city put through um, and see have seen come our way as far as social procurement goes. However, we as a company don't have um, policies per se to, to reflect that, to put it on paper. We believe in local. We've been around since 1947 and I've nothing I've heard from my, from my grandfather to my dad and uncles is support local, support local, support local. 
but we don't have that written out. And I guess where I'm going with this is how do we find, uh, where are there, and I saw that there was um, some resources listed from BiSocial, and I think I probably just need to look through those myself, but it does feel daunting. It does feel like one more thing that we have to work our way through in order to put what we do and say and believe on paper. Um, and is there assistance in that? I'm also asking on behalf of the Construction Association as well, because we're also looking into this and helping our, uh, our members um, achieve uh, or work towards uh, the policies needed to put this down on paper. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's totally fair, Craig. And I think everyone understands it's a really um, iterative stage. It's new for everyone, um, the city as well as the vendor community. Um, and so, uh, for instance, the social value questionnaires on the competitive bid, um, what is being asked as evidence is not um, necessarily, there's no one right answer. The city is uh, very open in terms of what that evidence is. Um, but in terms of resources to help you start to make uh, those policies, start to put this all in place. Um, yeah, by Social Canada, we have tons of resources. Uh, we have our own social procurement policy uh, as well. You can riff off of, um, so I can put some in the chat or if uh, Jackie wants to send it out um, with all, and any of the post reading material. Um, but yeah, we have tons of tools available. Um, for the suppliers um, out there. Great, anybody else? No, I, I just really thought that was a wonderful uh, series of presentations and all really complimenting and, and adding to a more fulsome picture of um, sustainable purchasing. And uh, I just really want to thank everybody who's both uh, attending and, and a big thank you to the, the presenters because I know that they're all incredibly busy. So thank you for sharing your wisdom. It's very appreciative. Um, I just wanted to let you know that Green Economy and Peter Rowe is recruiting now. <laughs> so if you have any interest in learning about more about us, um, you can uh, contact me through either our website. There's an opportunity to just book a 15 minute chat and I can tell you more about our program. Um, and I believe uh, Natalie's putting the link in the, um, in the chat. And then also we're hoping that if you get a chance, you can fill out our um, feedback survey. Again, uh, Natalie's putting the link in the chat. Um, so a final thank you. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and I really appreciate the time that our speakers have put into their presentations. Um, and again, the wisdom that they're sharing. And I hope that uh, the remaining remainder people are leaving with freshly inspired with new ideas and the potential of the impacts that they can have on their communities. So um, uh, thank you and uh, take care everyone. Thanks for your Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.